sleeping on top of the devil. Oh, y'all didn't hear me. All right. Look at your other neighbor. Look somewhere else across the room. Say, neighbor, take a good seat because you're seated on top of the devil. Amen. That, that means your problems are not on you. They're under you. Amen. That means oppression can't grab a hold of you. Anxiety and sickness doesn't determine your life uh, because the Bible says that you're seated in Christ in heavenly places and every enemy is under his feet. That means that whatever's been attacking you shouldn't be in your head. It should be under your feet. I got a couple amens, all right? You're not getting too excited, but I'm letting you know that there's a season of victory that God is storing up for the believer in this season. Uh, come on, can I get an amen to that? Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of the devil trying to grab me, grab my children, grab my marriage, trying to mess with my body. Come on, because the Bible says that every good and perfect thing comes from God. So your sickness didn't come from God. Your depression didn't come from God. Anything that is a bad on the earth did not come from God god but the bible says that every good and perfect thing comes from that means god's a good god and he does good things say amen praise the lord now look at somebody in the room say neighbor this is the year of restoration come on give god a shout because some of us need some restoration in our hearts and our souls you see because i know you look good today but some of you don't look like your story Oh, that would have been a good place to shout right there. Because if we would have looked like what we've been through, we'll be all tore up from the feet up. Amen. Thank God for the lashes and the mascara. Praise God. And, and the suits. Amen. But the truth is, is that if we look like our story, some of us, some people wouldn't want to sit next to us. But thank be to God because he's a restorer of our soul. That means no trauma from your past, no, no hurt from when you were a kid to even now can stain you or determine the person that you are unless you let it. Say amen. amen. And so we're going to be talking about the year of restoration. I talked about it a little bit on our New Year service. We're going to go a little bit deeper today. But before I do, I want you to understand something. If you listen to any great pastor, great apostle, or even prophets right now, they're speaking about the year of the open door. And where they get that from, it's from the Hebrew number 5784. Okay? And the year of the open door, is, it's, it's about God opening up a door for his people. This will be a season for your opportunity, for your business, for your family, that God is storing up a door. Say amen. Now, a lot of prophets, a lot of apostles, and we agree with them. We were at RTA, and they preached a powerful time about the open door and how it is, it is the year of the open door. But if we can just, like, zoom in a little bit in this house. Can we say this house? This house. Amen. As, as much as it's a year of the open door for God's people, I'm not speaking to a nation or now. I'm speaking to a house. I'm speaking to a spirit-filled church. Say amen. amen. So if you're a part of this house, you're part of this vision, You've been coming, you feel like God's grafting you in. This word is for you. Or even if you're here today, God has a word for you. Praise the Lord. And the truth is, is that we believe in this house that God's going to restore some things in our lives. And as I was praying, the Lord began to tell me, he said, son, if anyone's going to walk in through the open door, they need to be healed. They need to be whole. Because when they walk into the open door, they're going to destroy the opportunity. If you're not fully mature and ready for what God has for you, if you walk too prematurely, you can destroy it. Say amen. That means if you have a business, but if you're not ready to manage it, you can destroy it. Say amen. Right? So we must be, and one of the things that God wants to do in this house, he wants to restore a lot of our hearts, a lot of our minds, so that we can become everything that God wants us to become in this season. And in other words, for some of you, he wants to restore your prayer life. He wants to restore your worship. Some of them are like, all right, he's singing in the spirit now, praise the Lord. Because some of us haven't been praying. We haven't been worshiping. And the reason why, it's not because you don't want to. It's because you've been attacked. You're so weary that you, when you get up, you, your heart wants you to worship, but you're too tired to worship. So you go along with your day and you end up more tired. Some of our weariness and some of us just being tired, we get more sleep, but we wake up even more tired. How does that make sense? Like, I just need a rest. You go rest for 15 hours and you still wake up even more tired. With the headache, praise the Lord, you wake up worse. But the truth is that we don't need something natural, we need something spiritual. Amen. And if we can't discern that, we're going to keep seeking natural things. And we're going to neglect the spiritual thing, not knowing that the key is in the spiritual. Say amen. 
And so we're really going to bring in clarity, and you're going to hear our ministers this month talk about the vision of the year and what we're doing here at the house. But today, we're going to be talking about the year of restoration. Say amen. amen. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to go to Psalms 23, verse 1 through 3. <coughs> the Bible says this in the book of Psalms 23, 1 through 3. The Bible says this, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Say green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Say amen. amen. So the word the Lord means Jehovah. Amen. But what the definition of what that means, Brother Mike, is that the Lord or he's self-existent. He's self-existent. He, he's an eternal God. Some of you are not getting excited. Let me tell you what this means. It means God doesn't need help being God. He doesn't need my help. He doesn't need your Some of us should be happy because if they needed our enemy's help, then they, God wouldn't be come through for us. But because God doesn't need nobody, he's all God all by himself. In other words, the healing you need, you don't need a man to lay hands on you. You need a God that is healer. Say amen. God is self-existent in who he is. He doesn't rely on nobody. He doesn't need nobody to be God. Say amen. I know there, there, there's a teaching out there that, that God, God needs me and God needs No, God loves you and God wants to use you. But if you don't want to be used, he's going to move on to the next person. Amen. amen. If you don't know how to live right and live honorable and live according to the ways of God, God's not going to use you. He'll use somebody else because there's always someone on their knees worshiping God. And so the Bible says that the Lord is my shepherd. The self-existent God is my shepherd. What does this mean? The writer is determining a factor in his life. I'm here to tell someone in this season, you got to stop talking about what is wrong with you and what is wrong with your life. You got to declare the word of God over it. In other words, uh, when you're sick, instead of saying, oh, I'm tired of being sick and I'm just tired of my body hurting. I'm tired of this headache. I might as well just die and go to heaven already. The devil is alive liar you need to wake up and say my God is a healer my body belongs to God with your achy hands and your achy feet no matter what you're going through you have to put the word of God on it you got to operate in faith because we're hitting the season where turmoil is going to be around the world where things are going to get darker things are going to happen sickness is going to come and if you don't have a word on it you're going to lose faith you're going to lose hope and you're not going to be able to believe in the God that you were Worship today. So what is it good to worship a God but you can't believe him in a storm? What is it good to show up on Sunday, look all good in our suits, lift up our hands and dance all good. But when the storm shows up on Monday, we don't know what to do. The devil is a liar. Look at your name and say, neighbor, put the word on it. Come on, you got to put the word on it. So we have the writer saying, the Lord is my shepherd. In other words... He's self-existent. He's an eternal God. He don't need no help with anyone to be God. Now, this God that doesn't need help, he's my shepherd. In other words, he, he takes care of me. He's my protector. He's my leader. He, he guides me. He directs me. See, some of us just got to allow God to guide us. Some of us are in a bad season. We're coming out of a bad season right now because we didn't allow God to guide us. So we, th we think everything's going to change because it's 2024. No, ma'am. No, sir. If you don't pray, ain't nothing going to change. If you don't seek God, you ain't going to get a crazy revelation. Angels ain't going to come flying in your room. If you don't open up your Bible, you're not going to learn a new verse. It ain't magically just going to come and you're in the realm of the spirit. No, the devil's a liar. You see, but the reality is, is that for him to be our shepherd means for him to be our keeper. So some of you should have shot it right there. That he's going to keep me in all the chaos and everything that I may be facing and going through. No matter what comes my way and my loneliness, whatever trial, let it come. You know why? Because I got a God that don't need no help. And matter of fact, he takes care of me. Come on, for some single folk, that I don't need no one to take care of me. I got God to take care of me. Come on, for some of, us, some of our married folks say, God, I need you in this season. Praise the Lord. So he's an eternal God. He's a ruler, he's a keeper, he's a leader of our life. That's what it means to be a shepherd. When a shepherd will walk around the sheep, the sheep had to follow the shepherd. 
The sheep didn't do what they wanted. They were led somewhere. So the believers that think they can live however they want and do whatever they want, that time is over. And if you don't hear this word, you're going to struggle this year and the years to come. Because the world's going to get darker. There's, gonna, there's more sickness coming. That's going to be worse than COVID. There's going to be more, more chaos coming. We sense it in the spirit. There's so many things that are coming. There's going to be a market crash coming. There's going to be so many things coming. And if we're not ready for it, not naturally but spiritually, we're not going to be able to withhold in the storm. Because God wants to use you to be a light in the dark. So while everything's getting chaotic, everything's going crazy, God wants to use you to be a healer, to be a deliverer on his behalf. Say amen. That means when no one ain't got no money, you're going to have money. Amen. That means when everyone's sick and need a mask and they want to stay home, you're going to go in there and lay hands on them and they're going to be healed in the name of Jesus because of the God that you serve and not because of the system we live in. See, some of us are so used to this system that we don't know how to operate in the kingdom. So the moment someone operates in the kingdom, we shame them. Oh, brother, you ain't wise, and why are you doing all that? You know, you should be wearing your mask. You shouldn't go to work today. You should. We tell people if you're sick, stay home. But God says if you're sick, come to the altar. He says get the elders to come and lay hands on you. But some of us, our wisdom is in the world. So if I'm sick, I just don't want to offend nobody. They're going to think I'm crazy and I don't love them. The devil is a liar. If you're sick, you come to the altar. You call Pastor Joe, call Pastor Matt, and say, man of God, I need you to lay hands on me. Because we're entering a season that no matter what darkness comes around, there's some real light bearers in the room that are going to speak the word. I'm getting two amens. That's all right. I'm trying to pull you out of a system that you're used to living in. You can call me unwise and and all you want but the reality is I just believe God so if he says he's going to keep me and he's going to protect me don't get mad when I believe him some folk want to get mad when you believe God now he's our shepherd but look what it says because he don't need help because he keeps us because he protects us now the, the summer says I shall not walk in other words I shall not Lack. You see, when God's done with you in this season, you're not even going to want anything. Because the only thing you're going to realize is that all you needed was him. That if I have him, I have everything. But if I have everything I don't have him, I have nothing. You see, because that word literally means that you're not going to need anything. You're not going to have no need. I don't know about you, but I got some needs in my life, praise the Lord. I'm running to a place. A restoration. I'm running to a place where God is. Say amen. amen. See, this self-existent God is my ruler. Therefore, I shall not lack. Okay, so God don't need help. Say amen. And he's my shepherd, so he takes care of me. Say amen. Now, if God don't need help taking care of you, then are you ever going to be in need? No, because he don't need help. He can do it all by himself. So if he's showing up for you in prayer and you feel his presence, how is he not going to show up for you in the bills? Some of us are so anointed doing worship, but we ain't got no oil over our bills. Praise the Lord. All right. I'm talking to two people in the room. The truth is that we can worship when everything's going good, but can you worship when everything don't look good? Faith don't, don't, is not tested when there's nothing happening. It's when everything's chaotic, do you believe God? And it, this is the reality is that the enemy all year is trying to remove us from a place of hope, a place of faith, so therefore we can't love people. God, doesn't, God wants you to love people. Say amen. amen. But some of us are going through so much struggle that we can't even love people because all we're worrying about the battle that we're in. So you wake up, instead of trying to feed the homeless, you're like, but I barely got enough for me, praise the Lord. You better go get a job, Amen. And we don't live in the principle of giving and loving. So now instead of being a light, instead of being someone that loves, that can change, transform, transform someone's life by an act of giving, we never become a vessel of giving. Say amen. amen. So it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Oh, Y'all going to lose, lose me on this verse, praise the Lord. See, he taketh me light down literally means, I shared this on New Year's. You see, a shepherd, his job was to take care of the sheep, amen. 
And when they were ready to rest, they would have to be all fed, so full that they would just lay down. But the shepherd's job was to lead them to a place where there was a good pasture. In other words, there was no thorns, nor thistles, nor rocks. It was literally a place of rest. It was grass. So a shepherd's job is after they're done feeding them, is to take them to a place where they can go rest. Say amen. And it's what we call a green pasture. But the way a, sh a sheep lays down, it just opens up his legs and just lays down his stomach. It's just, what that means is that they have not one care in their life. They're just laid out before the good pasture. Amen. They, they're just laid out. How many guys want to be laid out before God? Amen. Imagine going through hell and you just laid out. Amen. You just, God, I love you. I say. Some of us just got to lay on our feet, but uh, lay on our stomach before God. And just like a sheep and say, Lord, you're going to take care of it. Amen. You see, but it's the job of the shepherd to take care of the sheep. So it, the shepherd will lead the sheep not only to food, not only to water, but to a good place to rest. And I declare over you that God's going to give you a season of rest. Where stress and disorder and things that you just seem you couldn't fix. And God says he's about to put rest on you. Rest on your mind. Rest on your heart. You see, because what you don't know, God, God wants to take you to a place of rest because the enemy wants to give you a heart attack. God wants to give you, uh, make you stressed out and lose all the hair, praise the Lord. But the reality is, is that God's trying to bring you to a place of, because that's where you can think clearly. That's where you can make decisions clearly. That's where you can hear God clearly. See, some of us don't know what God's doing in our life because we've been too stressed out, too worried about everything going on in our life. So we don't know what God is doing. Some of us, before you start your day, you just got to, Lord, I'm here. Some of y'all did it quick because y'all know what I'm talking about, praise the Lord. When the kids are acting crazy, when the bills just look crazy, the reality, when life is looking crazy, some of us just got to sit back and take a breather in the presence of God. You see, everything changes when you're in the presence of God. Someone can take a break and not be in the presence of God and still feel tired after the break. But when you take a break in the presence of God, you'll be ready for the next year, praise the Lord. Because it's something that you're tapping into that naturally someone can't tap into. You see, because God says that he's your strength. So when you have no strength, he's the one that uplifts you. So when you look back and you're like, man, I don't know how I made it through that season. You're right, you did it. God brought you through. Some of you are like well, showing up today and you're like, man, I shouldn't be here. I should be dead. I should be in jail. Yeah, you're right, you should. But because God stepped in and took you out. He didn't let you lose your mind. He, he didn't let you stay depressed in your room, make you stay broken. No, no. He brought you through. Because if you did, you wouldn't end up on the church on a Sunday morning. So he, he makes us lie down on green pastures. But what I love about that is that sheep don't lay down until they're completely full. That means they don't want nothing, they don't need nothing. And then they rest. Some of us just need more of him. And that's going to lead us to rest. The fact that we can't rest that night, some of us have, I'm, I'm talking serious. Some of us tug and turn all night and there's no rest for us because your mind is somewhere else. And God says, hey, I'm going to give you sleep in this season. I'm going to give you rest in this season because you're going to trust that I'm your Lord and I'm your shepherd. Look at what the, so it says green pastures, right? It says, he leadeth us beside still waters. This is so good. Can I tell you something? Sheep don't drink from rivers. They drink from streams. In other words, if water is rushing through, say amen. Sheep will not drink from it. They need still waters to drink from. You'll never see a sheep in a movie or anything. Drinking from, the, from, from a river, just flowing through. It's always going to be by a stream where it's gentle, where it's just steadily coming. And you must understand that God wants to bring you to this place of peace, this place of rest, so that you can be ready for what God has for your life. See, some of us are, are so, so much in warfare, we fight witches and warlocks every day. We're all traumatized that you go and pray, you can't even worship God because there's a witch in your room. That's not God's will for your life. 
You see, there's a difference between being in the second heaven and being in the third heaven. In the third heaven, when, what I'm talking about is when you go into your room and you start pray, praying. How many of you guys know that when you start praying, you start thinking about your problems? All right, I don't know about you, but, but sometimes I'll, I'll go into prayer and I'll start thinking about all the things I didn't do that my wife wanted me to do, praise the Lord. I'm just, oh, I, right? Like, I can't even worship. I got, or I'll go throw the trash first and then I'll come back, amen, <laughs> because I got I to gotta find my peace. But the worries of life always want to hinder you from tapping into the presence of God. You know, some of us go into prayer and we don't connect with God because we're too worried. We're too stressed out. We got so much on our mind that you go and you're like 30, 20 minutes in there and nothing's happening, nothing's moving. Why? Because you're caught up in your mind, caught up in your heart and what you're going through. Some of us literally got to walk in the room and literally grab what we're going through and, and say, God, every problem, everything that I've been going through this week, I just come and I lay it before you right here. And I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to worship you, and I'm going to give you glory. And whenever I have thoughts of those problems, I say, hey, you're going to go over there because I'm going to come and worship. I know I'm kind of crazy. I'm, I'm super prophetic. I literally do this at home. Like, I'll be going through a stressful season, and I'll be like, stress? You're going to stay over here. Open up my door and take them outside. And I walk back into my prayer room and say, Lord, I'm here. I'm ready for you. And whenever stress wants to come back in, I got to grab it sometimes and say, hey, you, you belong out here, praise the Lord. And it might look crazy, but it works for me. Why? Because some of us, the way uh, the enemy wants to talk to you, you got to talk to the enemy. Some of you, the enemy's in your ear when you got to take them out your house. But because we're so caught up, we don't know how to function. Because we're so stressed out, we don't know how to function. We don't know how to operate in the kingdom of God. Because in the kingdom of God, there's peace for you. There's joy. There's, there's, an unst- there, there's, a, there's so much of God available for you that you can grab as much as you want. Okay. Who needs joy? There's a buffet of it. Who needs peace? There's a buffet of it. But are you going to get it? Are you going to receive? Are you in position to receive from God? And if we're honest, most of us go through so many seasons because we're away from him. Or, or, or some of us, we, we start doing good for a week or two, praise the Lord. And by the third week, it, it, we're good enough to just keep going. And two months later, we're like, man, I'm just, I don't know what's going on. Going crazy. But if you look at your prayer life, you look at your uh, reading life, you look at your time spending time with God, it's just getting smaller and smaller because we're too busy. But the word busy literally means to be under Satan's yoke. So while you're too busy, just say the whole thing. Say, I'm just too busy being under Satan's yoke. That I can't worship, that I can't pray, that I can't read my Bible. I'm just too busy. So now we're under a yoke of the system, the 9 to 5 system, where we barely have enough energy to wake up, get our kids ready to take them to school, go to work from 9 to 5, then we get out, we're all burned out, some of us. We do something for an hour after work, and then by the time they get home, we're like, I'm just ready to go to bed. And when it comes to seeking the Lord, it's the last thing. And we don't have energy for it. We don't have time for it. But I'm giving you a key because this is your year of restoration. This is the year where you get your mind back, where you get your passion back, where you get the ideas of God back, where you get God's dreams for your life back. But it's going to take for you to get to a place of peace, a, a place before God where he delivers you, where he begins to make you whole again. Because some of you were already whole and ready for everything that God had. And the moment you stepped into it, the devil gave you a black eye. And you're like, I don't know if I'm ready for this. But the devil is a liar. He's not going to take what God has for you. Not your dream, not your business, not your family, not your children, not your marriage. Because if God said it, he's going to do it. So we see that he leads us beside still waters. See, some of us got, must understand that our place of power is in the place of rest and peace. It's not about being in warfare and fighting. Like some of us, we just go in our room. We're just like, just devil. Just start. But God wants to take you to a place of worship, a place of peace, where his presence is so thick that there's no enemy that can even come in and bother you. See, a few years ago, there was a season where I thought everything was about warfare. So I knew the witch in, in Indio, Coachella. I knew the witches everywhere, praise the Lord, by name. 
I'll go in my room and just, just start casting all the devils out. There was no devils there, Pastor. But I was casting them out. The devil, devil of this, devil of that. And there was a whole season where I stayed just in warfare. And I, I would show up. I didn't even do my hair no more, praise the Lord. I'll show up to church and I'm barely making it. Because I was like, how you doing? But I'm just in warfare. Praise the Lord. I, I'm just getting through, Pastor. I, I need you to pray for me that the Lord be strengthening me, praise God. But we get so caught up in what we're going through and what we're battling that we don't get caught up in how big and good our God is. You see, because when you get a revelation of how big and good God is, it makes your problem this small. And now you begin to look at your problem and your enemies. And you're like, my God's, my God's too big. That I'm not ignorant. My God's too big. I'm, so, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry that my God saved me and redeemed me. That he shed his blood on the cross for my life, for my sins. God put the crown of thorns so I can have peace in my mind. God shed his blood so I can be washed. Like, come on. Some of us just got to be grateful and come back to the place of just seeing God as he is. Because when we do, everything that you're going through becomes this small. Your sickness, your, your problem becomes this small. Because now you serve a big God. But there's a system that wants to make your God this small and everything else this big. So we come to church and we're barely making it. Some of us can't even make it to church sometimes because we're just so caught up in what we're going through. Say amen. See, he restoreth my soul. I love this, this verse because it means that he's going to repair us. And maybe, don't get it too excited, but when you repair something, it needs your attention. See, some of you got mad. I don't need no repairing. I don't need no restoring. I'm good. I'm a man of God. I'm a daughter of God. But what I'm really telling you is God's about to put his eyes on you. God's about to give you his attention. Because whenever you repair something, you got to give it. You got to give it, you can't repair something you don't attend to. You don't put your focus on. Right, like some of there's some things we got to we gotta attend to at home, praise the Lord. The laundry baskets and everything else, praise God. They need our attention, praise God. <laughs> Amen. The way those buckets need your attention, God says, I'm about to give you attention. Yeah. Because when I give you attention, depression is going to leave. Anxiety is going to leave. You, your hope deferred is going to leave. In other words, the, the feeling like your life ain't moving over, ain't getting nowhere. You're too, you're too caught up in what you're going through. It's about to dis uh, because he's going to show up. So now I want to read this verse. It's the same verse. It's 23.3, but it's a different translation. I love this translation because look what it says. This is where he restores and revives my life. He opens before me pathways to good pleasure and leads me along in his footsteps of righteousness so that I can bring honor to his name. In other words, why, why are we talking about this? God wants to restore you so that he can get glory out of your life. God wants to heal you so he can bring honor to his name. Because when someone says, how do I know that God is real? Go, let me tell you my story. Because if you knew my story, if you know everything I've been and who I was, uh, how messed up I was, amen. But when God came, you see, some, of, some people walk up to you and say, oh, you go to church now. That man that goes to church, all right. They look at Susan like, oh, you, you a woman of God now, all right, praise him. Because they don't see the woman of God. They don't see the man of God. See, but the reality is that God wants to get glory to his name by transforming your life. Because God's going to be so good to you that when people just meet you, they're going to know God. God's going to be so good to your marriage, to your family, to your children, that when people meet them, God's name's going to come up and someone's going to get delivered in the aisle of food for less. Uh, when you are, you're walking around and you're just not even worrying about your groceries no more, you're going to be, sis, I used to be there, I used to be right there. But you know what? God came through. And matter of fact, let me take care of you today. You see, 
God is leading us to a place of pasture, a place of peace. And I'm not saying that we don't got to push and do things for God. When I'm, I'm talking spiritual, God wants to bring you to a place, a state of mind, a state of condition in your heart where you understand who your God is. Now the worries of life cannot choke out the word of God out of your life. Because the Bible says that there's four different grounds. And one of the grounds is the ground that has thorns. Amen. And this thorn chokes out the seed out the ground. The seed is the word of God. How many of you guys ever received the word of God? How many of you guys ever received the prophecy? And God said, you're going to be this and you're going to do that. And God's going to use your life like this. Amen. How many of you guys can get excited for what God has spoken of your life? But the worries of life want to choke that word out. So now we're so worried that we can't see the prophecy being fulfilled. We can't see the word of God being fulfilled. But God wants to create you to be good ground. But that takes attention. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm going to get God's attention this season. All right, well, when he's looking at you, we're going, what you going to do? When, when you get God's attention, what you going to do with your life? You're going to still be playing with him, still sitting around, messing around, going up and down the street. What are you going to do? Are you going to stand before God? You know what? I'm getting things right. and I'm getting things order in my house. I'm getting things order in my life because I need you to restore. God, if you're going to do it for the family across the street, I know you're going to do it for me. If you're going to do it for a pastor so-and-so, I know you're going to do it for me because well, we're both your children and you're good, a good God. And God, I come before you, but I'm getting everything right. See, because there's some things in your life that need your attention. There's some habits that need your attention. There's some ways that need your uh... See, but if we're ever going to live a life of victory, we're going to go to our second statement here. It's called locking our eyes on truth. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 16 through 18, we're going to read this. One of the things the Lord began to minister to me, said, son, I'm going to restore the people. I'm going to bring them to a place of fullness or completeness of wholeness where, where, where literally I saw stress leaving your life. Saw worries leaving your life. But he said, the way I'm going to do it is when they lock their eyes on truth. They must understand truth. They must understand who I am in their life. We're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. Look at what the Bible says here. It says, therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, say light affliction, which is but for a moment. Is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The word do not lose heart literally means to be negatively influenced with the outcome of experiencing inner weariness i'm gonna say that again for the people in the back it says to be to lose heart means to be negatively influenced with the outcome of experiencing inner weariness one of the things the lord began to speak to me said my saints are weary they're too tired and there's a fatigue on you. There's a, that's why we, we drink more coffee and we drink more caffeine and we try to push and we try to push. But it seems like we're just more tired. We eat better, but we're still, we're changing our diets. We're, we're, we're living, trying to live a better lifestyle, but we're still, because the tiredness is not coming from what you're eating. Though some of us got to change our eating, praise the Lord. Some of our habits and some of us got to, the gym, amen, G-Y-M, -G amen, praise the Lord. But the truth is, is that some fatigue is coming from your inner man, from your spirit man. And the way we lift up our spirit man is through spending time with the presence of God. And prayer and worship and reading our word. So some of us are so tired because we have not been praying. The very thing that you're trying to do but you're too tired to do is the very thing that's keeping you tired. 
In other words, I'm trying to pray tonight, praise the Lord. But I might get too busy, too tired to pray. So I'm going to go to sleep and say a cute 10-second prayer before I go to bed just so I could check my nice Christian box off. Say, thank you, Jesus, for this day. I love you so much. And you just, boom, turn around and you go to sleep. So y'all y'all quiet because y'all know what I'm talking about. But the very thing that we're staying away from is the very thing that's keeping us tired. Because the moment you get into prayer, you're going to realize and be like, man, I've been here for two hours, praise the Lord. I need to go to bed. You're going to have so much energy coming out of prayer and out of worship that you're going to be ready to clean your house, praise the Lord. I need that anointing, amen. You see, to be weary, to be exhausted. So in other words, therefore, we are not exhausted. We are not weary. We are not tired. And then look at what it says here. It says, even though our outward man is what? That word perishing literally means to be soiled or, sp or spoiled. Like, ever got some fruit and it's, it's a bad batch and it's sp spoiled? And if you leave it there, what happens? It's just rotten and it just gets more. And so you throw it out. If you don't throw it out, it's going to get mold. Praise the Lord. And you, you got to throw it out. Amen. What this verse is literally saying is creating a reality that even though everything out here in my life is perishing, in other words, I'm getting older and my back's hurting. I'm getting older and my knees are aching. I'm, I'm getting older and I can't really do what I used to do. That's a sign of growth. Amen? You're growing, right? And you're like, man, I remember when I was young, I could do this and I could do that. And, and, and some of us that are hitting our, our, our midlife, we're like, man, like, I could still do it, but if I do a little too much, like, you know. But the reality is, is that our outward man is perishing. It's being spoiled. But God's not concerned about your outward man. He's not concerned about your wrinkles. He's not con concerned about your, 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 your eyes being looking like they're heavy. No, no. What he's concerned about is your inner man. You see, some of us are 50, but we feel like 20, praise the Lord. Come on, I got two amens, all right. That was a word for somebody. But he says, we do not lose heart, right? And it says, for our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Even though your body's acting up, your inner man is growing. Right? Your body's acting up, but your spirit is healed. Right, so it's talking about two parts that you're living with. So your heart wants to believe the word of God. I'm healed, I'm delivered, I'm set free. And then you, your body's aching. And you're, now you're stuck in between two realities. But you must understand that if, I'm saying if because some of us, God's will is to heal you. If God, if your body doesn't get healed, make sure your spirit does. Make sure your soul does. Your mind, your will, your emotions come into order where your trauma no longer defines you and who hurt you and who did this and who did that no longer creeps into you. Like it's funny to me how I talk to people who are 30, 40 years old and they be talking about they got hurt when they were 15 and 17 and how it damaged them and they can't move on and they just had this trauma in their life. And it's like, man, I got you're 40 already. That was 20 years ago. Like talking to me about a relationship that happened 20 years ago. But what happens is our hurt and our trauma locks us up in a cage. And every day we're growing, but our inner soul got stuck. So you're getting white hair. You're getting older. You're, you're moving on with your life. You got even got a promotion at work, but you're still that 17-year-old boy or girl that got hurt when they did you dirty. When you got trauma, when you got abuse, whatever you went through and you stay there. And what the Spirit does, He comes and He unlocks you from that trauma. He heals you, He ministers to you, and He brings you to a place that we call wholeness. Now it's your story, but it's no longer attached to you. That's why when people look at you, oh, I never would have guessed, man of God. I would never would have guessed. I remember when, when, when I met uh, 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 one of the barbers I was working with, and he looked at me and he's like, Hey, bro, I heard some stories about you. Are they really real? And I was like, well, it depends which one, brother. <laughs> hey, which one you want to talk about? And he looked at me. He's like, honestly, bro, I cannot see it. I'm, I want to prophesy this over you. Some of you are going to get so healed and so delivered this year. 
that you're not going to look like what you've been through. That people are going to look at your story and say, no, I, I, I can't believe this. I can't believe this. Because that's how good God's going to be in your life. So now there's two. There's the inward, there's the outward. Right now I'm speaking to your inward. Right? This is why fasting is so beautiful. Because it brings the two together. So some of you that didn't know this is going to be a good moment to announce our weekly fast that we're doing every month for the next three months. And we're, we started last night at 12 and we're going to be doing water fast all week. But what fasting does is that it pushes the plate back so now your outward body's hurting. I mean, some of you, your, body, your body's been talking to me all morning, praise the Lord. <laughs> In other words, you're hungry, it's growling, it's hungry. But your spirit wants God. Amen. And now the two are converging. And now you're on a journey for this week's span. And now there's going to be a battle for those two to separate. The food's going to come, the smell, and they're going to separate. If you take the food, if the moment you, you step out of your fast, but if you stay in it, what you're doing is you know, there's a convergence of your spirit man and your outward man. And I become one, and now there's things coming in order inside of you, and now there's going to be an expression outside of your life. What am I saying? In other words, habits that you couldn't break, when you get on this fast, you're no longer going to deal with. Some of you have been having a, a coffee addiction. All right, y'all didn't like that one. Okay. The moment you get on this fast, you're going to need coffee. You ain't going to need Starbucks with seven pumps of this and six pumps of that and, 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 and like this and like that. Amen. We, we drink sugar-free in the house of God. Right? You're, not, you're not even going to need sugar-free in the house of God. You can just, I got water, praise the Lord. But the truth is, why? Because you, when you come, you're putting your inner man, it's getting ministered to, it's getting strengthened. And now you're, you start living from your inner man, not from your outward man. You know why people live in sin? Because they live off their desires. Their outward desires. You know when you start living holy? When you start living inward. From your, your, when I'm saying your inner, I'm saying your spirit man. You're the man of God. This is not the man of God. The man of God's in here. It's in my heart. It's who I am when no one's around. When I'm locked up in my room and, and I know what I'm going through. I know what I'm struggling with. There's a man of God in there. And I got to speak to the man of God and say, man of God, you're going to break this habit this year. You're going to deal with this area because where I'm taking you, you got you to gotta, you gotta come into wholeness. See, but some of us, we stay so far away from the inner man, and we're living in the outward man, and we're living in our flesh. That when it comes to living the inner man, we're not ready. Because when sickness comes, your outward man's going to say, I'm sick. But your inner man's going to tell you something else. Amen. And the one you live out is going to be determined the one you believe. And I believe that God wants to break. Some of us have different realities within our mind. You have the reality where you come to church and you're around church people. That's you. Show up. We got our lashes on. Got our suits on. Turtlenecks, praise the Lord. Walking around, suited and booted. Show up. Then there's you at work. You know, it's in the middle, here and there. And then there's you at home when no one's around. We have different realities and they're not one. And you're this person at home and you're this person at work and you're this person at church. And some of us are getting so stressed out because we're trying to keep up with all three people that we are. But God says, I want to make you, I want to heal you, I want to deliver you so that who you are at home is who you are at work and who you are at work is who you are at church. The same person on the altar worshiping will be the same one that goes to work on the, on the scrubs, praise the Lord. But the reality is, is that you have to acknowledge, you have to give your heart and your soul attention and say, soul, where are you at today? Uh, soul, mind, will, where are you at? What, do, what have you been longing? What have you been wanting? What have you been desiring? Why don't you want to pray? Why don't you want to seek God? 
God? Why don't you want to go to, there's something wrong if you don't want to do the things of God. That if when we say you're going to fast and it makes you mad that we're fasting, there's something wrong when we're trying to get closer to God and you don't want to get there and you get mad and you get hurried. Like, why do we got to do all that? Why do we always got to be at church? And why are we going to do all that for the homeless and do that? There's something wrong with your inner man because when your inner man gets healed, you see the homeless man getting delivered, getting a home, and opportunities start coming. When you start getting healed, your ministry comes alive, and you don't see a broken kid or a broken little girl no more. You see the one you're called a pastor, and you say, how can I help you? How can I walk with you? What's going on? Because I was there once. There's an inner man that needs to get touched today. The Bible says, do not lose heart, for your outward man is perishing, but your inner man is being renewed day by day. He's talking to the church, not to the world. Those that get renewed in their spirit are those that are in covenant with God. Not coming to church every once in a while, clapping when you need to clap. It's are you connected to God every day of your life? When you say, God, you're my Lord, is he really Lord? Does he really make decisions in your life? You see, because we're entering a season where God has to be Lord. Not this cute God in the sky somewhere. That you don't know what he's doing today. No, the Lord that says, God, I'm not going to move until you tell me to move. Look what the Bible says, to be renewed literally means... To be completing a process. See, some of you have been going through so much warfare, but you, you don't realize it's your process. You've been in your process. You've been going through so many things, but you're really in a process, and God says your process is about to be up. See, because in, what you've been going through has been dealing with your character, with your anger, with your frustration. It's been confronting who you really are. So when the kid's that crazy, some of us want to throw a pan across the room, praise the Lord. Why? Because it's confronting who you really are inside. And God says, I'm, I've been processing that one. The one that's complaining, the one that's gossiping, the one that is dishonoring, the one that's doing all these things outside of God. Outside of who God wants you to be. God is confronting that person. You're not confronting the one that showed up today. The one that got all dressed up, put the suit on, said, I'm ready. No, he's confronting the one. That is in the room all by themselves and they have plots in their hearts and they got gossip and they got dishonored and they, they got weird and they just so mad at life. But God says, when I show you who I am in that place, I'm going to bring you out. I'm going to bring you out. See, because to be renewed means to go from one stage to another stage. So what he's saying is, don't get exhausted. Don't get weary. Even though what you're going through, your outward man is perishing. You've been feeling the flick. The, the Bible says light affliction. Well, you've been making big and too heavy to carry. The Bible says, oh, that's light. When you think about what you're living is so hard, think about the God carrying that cross. Because he compares our problems and says, that's, oh, that, that's, this. imagine walking up to God. And you tell him all your problems. He says, oh, yeah, that's light work. You got it. Some of us will get offended. But look what it says. The Bible says this, not me. It says your light affliction, which is but for a moment. You see, when you realize what we're going through is only going to be here for a moment. But who you are in God is going to last far more longer than what you're going through. See, Colossians 3.10 says that we put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. In other words, you're like, well, how do I speak to my inner man? How, how does my inner man get healed? How does my inner man get delivered? How does my inner man become what it's called to be? This is how it becomes. By you coming into knowledge and awareness of the image of God. It's coming to face-to-face -to -face understanding with who God is. When you understand who God is, you understand who you are. When you understand who God is, you understand who you're not. So when you want to be angry and you want to lash out, you know that's not God. See, there's seasons in my life where God was working some things out that were hidden, Sister Susan. 
And I would lash out. I would lash out with fast, like flash. Just lash out and walk out the room. But every, when I would lash out, I'll be in the other room. I'll, God would say, that is not me. He say, that is not me. I say, you're right, Lord. You know what I would do? I said, go back. And my daughter and my son, they could tell you. I'll walk up to them and say, I'm sorry that I talked to you like that. That right there wasn't God. That was me. Because that's the thing I wanted to do was be a bad reflection of God to them. So at home, you know who's my best friend? Sorry. I'm, so, I'm sorry that I stepped out of character. Th that man that showed up home from work tired and screamed at you, that wasn't God. See, because we're living in two spaces. But God wants them to become one. See, but the only way we become one is when we see him. Because the Bible says that he is holy. That word holy means that he's one. He doesn't have two minds. He doesn't think two ways like us. Where one day we want God, another day we don't even know we believe in him. And then some of us are, what is Christianity? No, but he's one-minded, one God. He has one way of thinking, one way of doing, that's it. And we're all growing into that. The only way we grow into that is when we come into face-to-face -face contact with it. And we just look at the image of God, the ways of God, the character of God, the heart of God, the mind of God, the ways of God. When we come into contact with it, that is only when that image can come into this image. It's not sitting down and coming and hearing a good message, hearing someone and clapping when it sounds good. It's you coming to God and facing who he is and facing who you are and understanding that you're really not that holy and you're really not that perfect and you really got some issues that God's trying to work out of your life. And when you come into that image and you become real with God and say, God, I look nothing like you right now, but I know you didn't bring me out of hell and out of my depression and out of everything I've been going through to leave me right here. So God, your word says that you're faithful to complete what you started in me. But can you come into contact with who you really are? Not Pastor George, not the one that stands and lifts up his hand to say, come on guys, lift up our hands before the Lord. No, the one that gets home and is tired and his flesh is acting up and he got to put them in place and say, man of God, you're not acting like a man of God right now. Put the act away and just be. God's looking for people who are really going to be this year. Be themselves before him. Because God is watching everything that we live out. Some of our kids are not in this room right now because they don't like what they see in us. Talk about all the God that we serve. But all they know is the devil that's, that's beating us up. All they know is about the devil that's making us torment them talk down to them but God says the only way you're going to renew is when you come into contact proximity when you come to this closeness with my image there's an image of God that you have to see that's going to change you forever when you that's why when you see God for the first way like man God you love me and you really understand that he loved you the way you love people changes and even when you mess up you're like Lord I'm I will sing you, Lord. Like, I'm, God, I'm thanking you that you don't love me the way I love people. Right? And so God is restoring the inner man. I want you to stand to your feet. The Bible says this, for these things which are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. I want to speak to someone, we're about to transition to prayer, but I want to speak this over someone. Some of you have been feeling a great affliction. Now what this word affliction means, means to be pressed together. You've been feeling an affliction in your life, and you feel like you're never going to get out of it. Like literally when I was preparing this message, the Lord told me that there's few of us in this room that feel like nothing's ever going to change. That we're just going to stay exactly where we're at. Ain't nothing going to change. Ain't nothing going to happen for me. But because the pressure of life and what you've been going through has been so uh, uh, rubbing against you. 
that's been squeezing literally life out of you. Some of our problems have been squeezing the life out of us. And I know as uh, I know it's easy for me to be like, oh, that light affliction, but I know that in our heart it's heavy. It's, I've been there. I've had those seasons where like, ain't nothing going to change. My marriage ain't going to change. My family ain't going to change. My house ain't going to Ain't nothing going to change for me. And there's this affliction that's coming against the saints. And it's rubbing against who, you, who God wants you to be. And it's just rubbing you. And it's literally squeezing the life out of you. Because that word affliction literally, mean, literally means to be squeezed. There's a squeezing happening in your life and it's not a good one. And it's trying to remove who you are inside of God. But I want to tell you this. That your light affliction is for one moment. And the glory that's coming is eternal. When you get the victory in this season, this victory is going to last enough for you, your grandkids, and their grandkids. That's what I mean. It literally says here, it says that there's a glory, eternal weight of glory. While you're facing a light affliction, a squeezing of life, God says, I'm producing an eternal glory. In other words, this glory that's about to come to you is not, it's going to be enough for your lifetime and the lifetime of your kids and their kids because it's an eternal glory. This is why the enemy for some of us has been fighting us all, all year last year because the moment you step into this, The enemy's literally, his hold on your family, on your children, is literally going to just break off. Because there's a war that you're fighting that is not for you, but it's for generations that are coming after you. The Bible says this, I want to declare these verses over you and then we're going to open up the altar. It says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. Where? In us, in the inner man, there's a glory coming to your spirit. There's a presence coming to your spirit. Look at what this verse says in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, 13. It says, for now we see in a mirror. I want you to close your eyes for a moment. This is what the word of God says. It says, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And now abide faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. This is what the Lord told me. He said, son, the enemy has been squeezing my people. He's been squeezing faith out of them. He's been squeezing hope out of them. And now the greatest one that I've called them to live in, they can't live in, which is love. So we're so faithless, we're so hopeless that we don't have enough to love. To love God's people, to love our children, to love our spouses. Because we're just so caught up in what is not happening for us. But look at what this verse says. I'm going to close with this one. Isaiah 40, 29 through 31, it says, He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with eagles, mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not grow faint. I want you to lift up your hands. This is what the Lord is saying to you in this season of restoration. When you come into this place, what was hard is going to be easy. What was hard in ministry is going to be easy. What was hard at home is going to become easy. What that means is what used to stress you out is not going to stress you out anymore. What used to get you tired and weary and make you feel like you wanted to give up is not even going to have an inch to be able to make you to give up. 
Because God says, do not grow weary. Because those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength like eagles. There's a new strength coming. There's a new strength coming to the body. Now, Father, I thank you for this man of God, Lord. And I just